Welcome to the American Lung Association's Educational Learning Opportunity, Sarcoidosis, What You Need to Know. There are two presenters for today's webinar, Dr. Lisa Meyer from National Jewish Health and Ms. Tia Gray, a patient living with sarcoidosis. As a reminder, at the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All of the boxes are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide areas to maximize it, to maximize it or full screen by clicking on the arrows at the top right corner. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A box. Any questions that can't be answered today will be addressed at a later date. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please let us know via the Q&A box. So the webcast is being recorded and will be made available tomorrow and, you can, and can be accessed using the same link you used to register. And now we'll begin the webcast, and I'll turn it over to Barbara Kaplan, National Director for Lung Health Education at the American Lung Association. Thanks so much, Dana. And welcome, everyone. The American Lung Association is so pleased to have you join the conversation today to learn more about sarcoidosis, a disease that affects about 200,000 people in the United States. We are joining forces with the Chess Foundation and the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research this April during Sarcoidosis Awareness Month to educate patients, caregivers, healthcare providers, and the general public about sarcoidosis through a coordinated awareness campaign. For today's learning opportunity, we have brought together an expert pulmonologist and a patient to provide insights about the disease from risk factors to diagnosis, treatments, and what's on the horizon to best help patients. We'll also discuss options to best support patients with sarcoidosis and their caregivers and learn about resources that can help along the way. The American Lung Association is the leading organization working to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. We do this through research, education, and advocacy. Our work is focused on five strategic imperatives, uh, to, to defeat lung cancer, to improve the air we breathe, to reduce the burden of lung disease on individuals and their families, to eliminate tobacco use and tobacco-related diseases, and to accelerate fundraising and enhance organizational effectiveness to support the urgency of our mission. Sarcoidosis is an inflammatory disease characterized by the formation of granulomas, tiny clumps of inflammatory cells in one or more organs of the body. It mostly affects and more commonly affects the lungs and approximately 90% of sarcoidosis patients are diagnosed with pulmonary sarcoidosis. Through education and support programs for those living with lung disease, their caregivers, and those that love them, the American Lung Association is continually working to reduce the burden of lung disease and, and patients living with a lung disease. So for today's webinar, we hope you will gain a bit better understanding of how sarcoidosis affects your body, be able to identify treatment options available to control symptoms, prevent complications, and improve health outcomes, and also to find support and resources along the way. Today's educational program is made possible with an unrestricted grant from Mallinckrodt. Um, we'd like to thank them for their support for today's educational opportunity. During today's presentation, you'll hear from an expert pulmonologist, Dr. Lisa Meyer from National Jewish Health, and a patient and advocate, Ms. Tia Gray. Welcome to you both, and we are so pleased to have you with us today. Before we get started, we'd like to learn a little bit more about you. So we've started a poll, and we've asked for you to please select a statement that best describes you. Um, have you been diagnosed and are a patient living with sarcoidosis? Are you caring for someone with sarcoidosis? Are you a licensed healthcare professional, a health educator, um, or maybe you're a lung association staff person? Um, please make your choice now, and we'll give you a couple of minutes to uh, get your entries in. Uh, 
All right, let's see where we are. It looks, that, looks like most of the people joining us today um, are patients living with sarcoidosis. So welcome to you. We have about four presenters who are caregivers. We have a few um, licensed healthcare providers, um, about 8% of our participants, and a number of our uh, colleagues across the country from the American Lung Association. So welcome, everyone. Glad to have you with us today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lisa Meyer, who is the Chief of uh, the Division of Environmental and Occupational Sciences and the Professor of Medicine at National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado. She works within the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Sciences in the Department of Medicine, the School of Medicine, and the Environmental Occupational Health Department in the Colorado School of Public Health at the University of Colorado in Denver. Dr. Meyer is board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, and occupational and environmental medicine. She received her bachelor's of science degree from Cornell University and her doctor of medicine from Duke University School of Medicine in 1991. After completing a residency in internal medicine at Duke, Dr. Meyer completed a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine, a residency in occupational and environmental medicine, and a master's of science in public health at the University of Colorado in Denver. She is a clinician researcher whose major research and clinical interests focus on defining genetic, genomic, and epigenetic, and exposure risk factors in occupational, environmental, and idiopathic granulomatosis. These investigations are centered on two diseases, sarcoidosis and chronic beryllium disease, or CBD for short. Dr. Meyer sees patients in the clinic with these diseases. Her translational research has implications for therapeutic and preventive interventions that they hope to, remove, to move from the lab to the workplace or bedside. In addition to the above activities, Dr. Meyer enjoys teaching house staff and students educating patients, physicians, healthcare providers, employees, and providing consultation to communities, workers, and industry. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Meyer, and I'll let you take it from here. Well, thank you, Barbara, for that very kind introduction, and thank you to all of you for being on the call today. And I'm going to try to give an overview on sarcoidosis. For many of you, this may be information that you've either heard before or Maybe you'll gather something a little bit different, or for others, totally new information. So first of all, what is sarcoidosis? Well, as Barbara said, it's a lung, a lung and multi-system. So any potential organ in the body can be affected by sarcoidosis. But 90% of people have lung involvement. It is really classified by these clusters of white cells called granulomas, and you'll see a picture of these here on the screen. We have to exclude a number of other diseases to come to a diagnosis of sarcoidosis, which actually causes a bit of a conundrum or a difficulty or pitfall in getting a diagnosis, and oftentimes delay. We don't know what causes it. As an occupational environmental lung doctor, that's part of my interest is trying to sort out and figure out what is causing this. You'll see the picture here on your right-hand side shows all of the various organs that can be involved. And there are others that aren't listed there. The most common ones really are the lungs, the liver, the skin, the eyes, the lymph nodes, and then any other organ um, in the body can um, be affected. So how does sarcoidosis occur? What do we know about its development? Well, what we think, and the reason, again, as an occupational pulmonologist, I've become interested, very interested in this disease, we think that there's an exposure. We don't know yet what it is and that that exposure in the setting of someone who is genetically susceptible can result in sarcoidosis. Now, what you'll notice if you look at the figure here over on your right-hand side of the screen is that what we think happens is there is an exposure to some substance. There have been a number of them that have been proposed. Bacteria like tuberculosis or mycobacteria, 
propriana bacteria, other exposures. World Trade Center, we know people who were exposed at the World Trade Center developed sarcoidosis. And then there are other exposures that have been found in research studies to be associated with sarcoidosis. Again, we don't know that any of these definitively causes sarcoidosis, but these are some of those proposed exposures that may result in sarcoidosis. And what we think happens is after that exposure, some people develop an immune response. The normal response is that maybe the body develops some inflammation, but that it kind of quiets itself back down. Whereas in people with sarcoidosis, that immune response seems to perpetuate, and those granulomas form. Now, again, in some individuals, those granulomas can actually go away. The disease can resolve. In others, it can, they can perpetuate, and you can develop more severe. So that's what we think we know about the pathogenesis or the development of sarcoidosis at this time. Now, who develops sarcoidosis? Well, Barbara mentioned that we think about 200,000 people in the U.S. There are studies suggesting that about 10 to 35 per 100,000 people in the U.S. have sarcoidosis. And I gave you a big range there. Why that range? Well, some of it depends on what groups we're looking at. There's a slightly higher risk in women than men. I put a question mark there because in some organ involvement, that may not be the case. There's some question about whether men may be at slightly higher risk of developing cardiac involvement, for example. You'll see on the top right-hand um, corner that there is a graph showing age along the bottom and then percent of patients. And you'll see the male and female, and you'll see that in general, you have an increased number of people developing sarcoidosis, peaking at around age 40, but staying up there up till about age 50. Maybe a little bit higher for men earlier on, and then later higher for women. There are rare cases of children developing this disease, but in general, it's age 30 to 60. And that's what also, this, stu this study down at the bottom right-hand corner shows too. And this is just for um, women. This was an age-specific rate of sarcoidosis, so yearly rate of black women in the Black Women's Health Study, showing, again, this peak around age 40 to 50, but pretty significant numbers from about age 30 up to even over age 60. Now, we know that there's a higher risk for blacks than whites, somewhere between two and a half to three-fold higher risk of if you're black that you're going to be more likely to get sarcoidosis. Now, again, I have lots of patients that come to my clinic and say, I'm a white man, and yet I have this disease. When we talk about risk factors, those aren't absolute. It's all relative. Some things put people at a little bit higher risk, but that doesn't mean if you don't have that risk factor that you can't get the disease or that if you have it, you will. There have been other exposures that we, I just mentioned some in the previous slide, that also have been associated with risk and sarcoidosis. Being in the military is one that's been associated, for example. Some of those differ by race and gender. Maybe that explains some of the differences we see in the rates of sarcoidosis in these groups. Hormones seem to have an impact. Women who get pregnant later have a lower risk of developing sarcoidosis. People who've gained weight in adulthood or are, are obese have a greater risk. There are some studies that suggest maybe if you live in the Northeast, you have a greater risk, although I can tell you we see a lot of sarcoidosis in Denver, too. So Barbara, do you want, or should I ask this question? <laughs> I'm happy to uh, ask this, um, but we are uh, curious to know from our participants today um, where your disease is active. So please make your selection now. Um, lungs, lymph nodes, skin, eyes, heart, brain, and nervous system, bones, joints, or muscles. We'll give people just a couple of seconds to put in, lock in their answers. Okay. Aha, looks like we have uh, the majority of callers um, 
which seems uh, very uh, replicating, you know, the statistics as well, uh, prim primarily affecting the lungs, lymph nodes, skin, eyes, and heart. Similar to what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. So people often say, well, what are the symptoms of sarcoidosis? And really they vary, and they vary based on those organs that are involved, as you just highlighted for us. Now the lung, because it's most common, um, is the one often we talk about. And we'll spend a little bit more time on the lung um, in our webinar today. Uh, so cough, shortness of breath, chest tightness, wheezing, and reduced activity, your ability to do some of the normal things that requires more exertion, for example, are often symptoms. Now, these aren't symptoms that really are specific to sarcoidosis, but really can happen with any lung disease. But they're ones for you to notice as a patient and if they change, or as a care provider, if you're noticing that, that your loved one is having more problems with chest tightness. or Now, people can have some systemic symptoms. That means symptoms that suggest more of a, a diffuse process, and those can include fevers and night sweats, Fatigue is really common and probably one of the most troubling symptoms that patients have and that doctors often ignore because we have a hard time figuring out how to treat it. Pain can occur, rash, especially in those with skin disease, joint or muscle aches. Sometimes that can indicate that the joints or the muscles can be involved, but sometimes we see that as a, just a response to a systemic disease. Vision difficulty, again, makes us worried about the eyes being involved. And as I mentioned, there are many, many others depending on what organs an individual has active at the time. So making a diagnosis of sarcoidosis, as I mentioned earlier, can be quite difficult. And I know many of my patients come to me complaining that, one, they've had a delay in the diagnosis. They were told that they had the big C word, cancer and then finally found out after potentially months that they had sarcoidosis. Well, why is it so hard? Well, first of all, I mentioned it's a diagnosis of So we have to make sure that people don't have things like cancer or an infection or some other disease process going on before we can call something sarcoidosis. And unfortunately, a granuloma does not equal sarcoidosis. So people can end up with a biopsy that shows a granuloma. And again, in my clinic, oftentimes they've been exposed to some other substance, and I can actually say it's a different disease than sarcoidosis. So the problem being that there's no gold standard, and so it can be hard to establish it. I also like to tell physicians, healthcare providers, and patients that we have to really reassess the diagnosis of sarcoidosis patients almost every time we see them because people can develop new symptoms and new organ involvement. And that's where, as doctors, we have to continue to think about what our patients are telling us as far as problems that they're having. There are also some organs that are more difficult to diagnose. So if you have a chest X-ray that looks like the one I've shown here, that can be simpler. But if you present with heart problems, typically heart failure or abnormal heart rhythm, or something that looks like a stroke and is really neurologic disease, those can be harder to, de to determine that they're related to sarcoidosis unless you already have sarcoidosis. We also have what's called the parasarcoidosis, sarcoidoses. So para is next to or adjacent, so a paralegal helps an attorney, but is not an attorney. So parasarcoidoses are manifestations of sarcoidosis that aren't directly due to the granulomas. And a classic one is the small fiber neuropathy, but which we think are a sequelae or result because of sarcoidosis. And those can also be difficult to diagnose. And then sarcoidosis is one of the great masqueraders. It's something that can present in very many different ways and can make it incredibly difficult to diagnose. So usually we do need to demonstrate those granulomas to confirm that it's sarcoidosis, but again, just develop showing that it's the granulomas may not be sufficient to give you a diagnosis of sarcoidosis. 
one of the big um, issues that I come across is that sometimes people end up with invasive surgical biopsies to get the diagnosis made. And in general, most people should be able to be diagnosed with non-surgical means, usually with a bronchoscopy. And I'm just showing a picture of a bronchoscopy in the upper right-hand corner here. A bronchoscopy is a fiber optic tube that we pass usually through the nose or the mouth, down the back of the throat, and into the lungs. And we can take small biopsies the size of about a pencil tip from the airway, from the lymph node, in these endobronchial ultrasound-guided biopsies, or from the lungs. And usually we can, if we take enough of the biopsies or if we're focused on an area where we know lymph node is enlarged, we can usually get the biopsy. Now, I'd rather have somebody have a biopsy like that than have to have a surgical lung biopsy. We do try to go to a place where maybe there's, um, you don't even need a bronchoscopy. So if people have skin involvement, sometimes we can get a biopsy from the skin. But we usually want to see that there's involvement in another organ to confirm that truly that skin abnormality that we see is sarcoidosis. Because again, occasionally you could get an infection that could cause granulomas in this case. When other organs are involved, we sometimes don't get a biopsy. And those specifically are for heart and nervous system or cardiac and neurologic disease. We use surrogates because again, a, most people, we don't want to be biopsying their brain or their nerves or their heart. And so we'll use things like a lumbar puncture or an MRI of the heart or the brain to help us. And again, we're looking for these clusters of white cells that are really purple in the picture underneath the um, bronchoscopy. Now, I don't want to go through all of this. I'm just showing you that to work a, a workup for sarcoidosis should include a very thorough physical exam where we are really trying to evaluate any potential organ that might be involved as a physician. So we're trying to look at the skin and see if we have skin involvement. We're feeling the lymph nodes to see if we have enlarged lymph nodes in the neck or the groin or the um, armpits. And we're listening to the heart and the chest and doing a thorough neurologic exam to see if there are abnormalities there. In addition, we usually do, um, as sarcoidosis special, specialists, a number of lab tests. And again, there we're looking for different organs, a blood count to look to see if the spleen or the bone marrow is involved, chemistry panel to look for the kidney and the liver function, um, and then an EKG to see if the heart rhythm is normal. We usually recommend an ophthalmology consultation because ophthalmologists have an amazing view into the, to the eyes and can actually make a diagnosis of sarcoidosis eye involvement in their office. And again, other testing usually depends on what kinds of symptoms the patient's having and or our concerns about other organ involvement. A lot of this workup is something that needs, should happen on an every other year or every year basis or more frequently when people are, are undergoing treatment so that the doctors or healthcare providers can get an idea of how active or how bad the sarcoidosis is and or if there's a response to treatment. So when we talk about sarcoidosis, I think it's important to think about quality of life because this is a disease that really can affect people's quality of life. And quite honestly, we don't understand the healthcare burden really well. There was a study um, done by Dr. Swigris at, at my institution and it's shown here on the right side of your screen. And he looked very briefly at the death certificate data that we have, um, as a country, amassed um, over a number of years and looked at different groups for the numbers of deaths and then the rates of deaths. And what you'll notice is overall, you've got the rates for men on the top and women on the bottom. For all those rates and the numbers are going up. They're going up in and they're at a higher rate in blacks than in whites, but they seem to be going up in, um, in both groups and in women. The other thing that we've noticed is that there's been an increase in the number of cases of cardiac sarcoidosis from a Finnish registry. So in Finland, they have way more data than we do on um, healthcare issues, and they have been sh they've shown, if you look at the number of cases of cardiac sarcoidosis, that those rates seem to be going up.
So many of us in the field are concerned that there's been a ch either a change in the disease or we're become, becoming better at diagnosing it or both. But we're worried about that because we really are concerned that this disease has a significant impact on quality of life. Most, most people don't die of sarcoidosis. They die with it. But it can make their life not the best as they're going through it. So when we talk about that, people often ask me, well, what, do you, what should I expect from my disease course? What's the natural history of this disease? Well, I can tell you that in general, we really don't have a good handle on that for each individual. In general, I've plotted on the right-hand side the two basic groups. There are people that seem to have remission of their disease. They get the disease, and oftentimes within two to five years, their chest x-ray has either improved markedly and or resolved. Now, the textbooks say that's about 70% of people. I can tell you that's not my experience in my clinic, but I probably have a biased clinic because I see people who come from across the country and across my region because they're worried about their sarcoidosis or they're having trouble with it. And those people are those progressive ones that I've shown here where their disease seems to be getting worse. It's more active. Now, there are some folks that will tell you that they kind of have a waxing and waning course, where maybe it seems to get worse, better, worse, and better. And that's the group that I showed in the squiggly in the middle. So we don't have a great idea exactly of how groups fall into these different categories. There is some thought that most people will develop new organs. So if you're diagnosed with lung disease and you're going to have other organs, that those may happen early. That may be the case on average within the first two to five years, but I can tell you we see people who develop other organ involvement years after their disease has been um, diagnosed. We also know that people who are treated in the first two years of their treatment tend to need ongoing treatment. And that we know that people who have more progressive disease tend to be lower socioeconomic status. So they don't have as high an income, they have lower income, they have um, less education, and we don't really understand why that's the case. We know that blacks and women also tend to have more progressive disease, and we're starting to understand that there are likely some genetic risk factors that tell us that, that some people are more likely to have progressive disease. Those are not tests that are available because they don't have good predictive value, at, at least at this time, but an area where many of us really are trying to, to develop testing so that we could help tell somebody when they come in the clinic whether they will or will not have more progressive disease. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking about pulmonary sarcoidosis because a lot of people hear about stage. And they, this is a, an x-ray stage, and they think about cancer staging. And I can tell you that it is not the same thing. Um, when people have um, pulmonary sarcoidosis, we can see uh, these four different general ways the chest x-ray is abnormal. In stage zero, they actually have no abnormality. And sometimes another organ, for example, is found to be um, abnormal. And then when we do a bronchoscopy or if we do a CAT scan of the chest, we find out there actually is some involvement. Stage one is just when these lymph nodes which is right around the middle of the chest, so those kind of fluffy areas, those become enlarged. Stage two is when you have the lymph nodes and then you, the lungs themselves are abnormal on a chest x-ray. Stage three is the same thing as stage two, but you don't have lymph nodes. And then stage four is where you end up with scarring, fibrosis, and loss of lung volume. Now, people don't necessarily go from stage zero to one to two to three to four. Some people start at stage two, and they go back to stage one or stage zero. Some people start at stage four. So this is where it's not the same as cancer stage. But I always think it's important to talk about it. Now, what we really try to do for pulmonary sarcoidosis is assess people's symptoms and how well the lung is working by doing breathing tests. That's what this gentleman is doing right hand. And that's called lung function. And those are the kinds of things that we use to think about whether we want to treat somebody, if they're having lots of symptoms or they have abnormal lung function. Now, that's just for the pulmonary sarcoidosis. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about treatment um, here next. So 
when do we treat? Well, we don't treat just anybody who has sarcoidosis. Some folks, as I mentioned, actually will have resolution of their disease. And so those people, we probably don't want to mess around with the lung's normal healing response. But we try to control disease so that people don't end up with organ impairment for pulmonary disease, for example, on oxygen, to improve symptoms, quality of life. Again, in pulmonary sarcoidosis, to avoid fibrotic or end-stage lung disease, improve lung function, talked about the oxygen, increase activities, and then for other organs, avoid heart failure, permanent neurologic impairment, disfiguring skin disease. There are a number of therapies, and this is primarily focusing on pulmonary sarcoidosis, although we use these for a lot of other um, organ involvement too. Sometimes we want to just give people symptomatic treatment from, from a standpoint of the lungs. And we'll give people inhaled steroids or, or medications that open up the airways, bronchodilators, similar to what we use for people with COPD or asthma. Usually corticosteroids, prednisone, is our next and most commonly used drug. I can tell you there's a lot of side effects with prednisone, so many of us, if we think someone's going to need long-term treatment, don't want to use a lot of prednisone, but skip to the cytotoxic agents. Borrowed these from our rheumatology colleagues. Again, we don't need to go into the details here. Then there are other therapies that we kind of use as third-line agents if those cytotoxic therapies either aren't tolerated, people aren't responding to them. Anti-TNF therapies, infliximab, um, adalimumab are, are a couple. There have been some trials, very early ones looking at B-cell therapy, and there are other ones that are ongoing. Unfortunately, there are very few, if any, of these therapies that are FDA approved for sarcoidosis, and Axar gel is the only one that is. Um, but again, we don't really know whether it's any different or better than prednisone, and that's a study that will be starting soon. So when we're talking about treatments, unfortunately, as I mentioned, there's lots of side effects. And so it would be helpful if you all can let us know how often do the side effects from your sarcoidosis treatment limit what you can do? Never, some of the time, most of the time, all of the time, or if you're not on treatment, not applicable. You can maybe go ahead and answer the questions now. We'll give you a couple seconds. All right, time to move on, Barbara. Yes, sounds good. So some of you said none of the time, but you can see a lot of you, almost a third said some of the time, and almost 20% or one out of five said most of the time, and 6% all the time. And that's a problem that we've had with the treatment of sarcoidosis. And in part, it's related to corticosteroids, but it's also related to some of those age, other agents we talked about. And so with corticosteroid therapy, First of all, oftentimes we're using too high a dose. Um, most of us in the sarcoidosis clinics are really starting at lower doses, 20 to 40 milligrams. And there are studies that suggest improvement in symptoms and lung function in the short run. Improved chest X-ray and symptoms between up to two, three to 24 months. The problem is we don't have a whole lot of long-term data. And there's some data to actually suggest that people can get worse symptoms because of side effects. And this graph over here on the right-hand side just shows you that usually we start off high, we taper it down, we keep people on the steroids, we try to taper off. The problem is this last part, this relapse, pretty common with steroid therapy. And that's where we often will go to other agents. Agents to try to reduce the steroids to as low as possible or take people off of them because of the side effects. The issue is, that we have good, not so bad, not optimal, but not so bad treatment for kind of moderate to severe disease with the prednisone, methotrexate, and infliximab, as I'm showing you on the graph on the lower left-hand side. And we have some good disease for symptoms for pulmonary disease, but we don't have great treatment for kind of this in-between group. And that's where a lot more study is needed. So with all of that in mind, where would we like to see sarcoidosis future going? Well, there are a number of studies that are ongoing or future studies that we'd like to plan that we would like to then disseminate and 
use in the clinic to improve people's quality of life. Precision medicine is something where I, I say sarcoidosis is the, the, the poster child of precision. For every patient who walks into my clinic, they really need to have their care customized. It's not a one-size-fits-all because each of you, as you've already seen, has different organs involved, different side effects. We really need to understand who's going to get worse or who's going to get better. Because if that were the case, maybe we could start treatment earlier. We also would love to know how will they get worse? What organs will become involved? If we could know that someone would not only have lung involvement, but have neurologic or cardiac, and we could try to avoid that and, and focus treatment, that would be ideal. When will people do that's another big one. Sometimes this happens kind of out of the blue. Ideally, we'd really like to understand in a way that we could prevent decimating effects. So just in summary, not all granulomas are sarcoidosis. Really, this disease requires multidisciplinary care and treatment. And so usually it's a group of doctors whether it's a radiologist helping look at the x-rays, a neurologist, a cardiologist, and a pulmonologist, or sarcoidosis doctor, sarcoidologist, all working together. We have to always look for other organs, continually reassess people's status, and know that what makes it hard is not all symptoms are due to sarcoidosis. Sometimes they're due to other common things or the medications that we're giving people. And unfortunately, not all symptoms are due to other diseases. I know that's where some of you end up in a, a bit of a feeling caught betwixt and between with some of your. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Barbara. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Meyer. I learned so much about this disease, and I'm, I'm seeing a number of questions come in. So I think others, you are inspiring people uh, to think, and um, they have questions as well. Um, and just a reminder to folks, um, if you do have a question, you can enter it in the Q&A box. So thanks again, and, and hopefully you have a better understanding of how sarcoidosis affects the body and the treatment options that are available. Um, looking beyond the science, um, is the impact that sarcoidosis has on a person's life? And here with me to share the patient journey is Ms. Tia Gray. Um, Ms. Gray was first diagnosed with sarcoidosis in 1996. And after diagnosis, her journey began with um, a treatment regimen that left her unable to do what she loved most, which was running and exercise. Um, today, Ms. Gray is drug-free. She is running half and full marathons. She is raising her voice, advocating for research in lung health as an American Lung Association Lung Force Hero and a Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research Patient, patient Ambassador. In addition, she is actively helping the American Lung Association and the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research raise money for research and patient support. So welcome, Tia. And um, I, I think I'd like to start at the beginning, if that's okay with you. Um, so you were first diagnosed in 1996. What were your symptoms or what motivated you to see a physician in the first place? Um, well, the first thing that happened, I felt super tired. Um, I started to lose weight, and um, my um, body just didn't feel the same, and I felt nodules on the side towards my temples and um, in my neck area, um, a little larger than normal, than lymph nodes. So that raised um, a question of something going on because I know that that is a sign of some type of infection in the body. And that's when I went to see the doctor. And the first, the doctor had no rhyme or reason for what was going on with me. And then they started to speculate, and it became diagnosis such as cancer, lupus, until they actually took a biopsy and some blood. And then, excuse me, um, the diagnosis became clear at that point. Great. So, um, what was the what type of provider did you see first? Um, I saw my physician? first. I saw my family physician, and then um, I went to a pulmonary doctor. Great. And have you have you ever heard of sarcoidosis before? 
No, that was my first. I'd never heard of it um, and n- didn't know what I was in for, what my journey would consist of. Okay, so you have a diagnosis of sarcoidosis. Tell us a little bit about your experience as a patient. What were some of your, your feelings when you were first diagnosed? Um, first diagnosed, I had a lot of fear because I knew that my body wasn't doing what it um, was doing in the past. I was super tired. I couldn't walk a block. I couldn't even walk across the floor without getting out of breath. And then the drop in weight was totally unusual. I mean, it wasn't a a large person, but I wasn't to the point that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I was super thin. And then um, I just didn't feel like myself. So um, I went to see the doctor. The doctor started to speculate. And then it was just when I first went to see the pulmonary doctor, the first thing was, okay, you have sarcoidosis, and let me give you steroids. And that was a a different beast of its own because the steroids put on tons of weight and then it made me nervous and and jittery. It made me um, have night sweats and it made me, um, it was just a total different experience. And then as I started to take the prednisone and the doctor had no rhyme or reason on, okay, you're still feeling sick, let me give you another increase in your dosage. So that increase in dosage created more problems for my health and also creating more body fluid and weight, something I wasn't used to, which caused more, it caused me to go into depression. Yeah. Where, where did you first turn for help once you were diagnosed? Um, I didn't have any much resource. So what I did was just look at the doctor that I was assigned to for information and he didn't give me information at all. I mean, he just put, as I would say, put a Band-Aid on it by giving me the prednisone, which was the steroid. Yeah. And then I started doing the research to find out what I needed to know more about the disease and then figured that this doctor wasn't a doctor that I needed to see and reached the end between my sister and I. We did research and found a doctor that wanted to get me better and wanted to get me back to a normal lifestyle. Great. And can you think about maybe uh, was there one tool in particular or any resource that you found that you that was particularly helpful when you were first diagnosed? Um, to be truthful, when I first yeah. was diagnosed, there wasn't one particular positive resource that I could find. After doing some research between my sister and I and then the doctor, the second doctor after firing the first doctor became more, I got more education and things became more clear that it was necessary for me to change my diet and change my um, style of, and I've always been a healthy person, but um, I became a strict vegan, took out sugar and then he started to see positive results, the pulmonologist, and was able to decrease my prednisone and give me something different to feed the disease instead of the a steroid. Great. Um, so one of the things that I found so inspiring about your story was your mantra, uh, one step, one mile, one breath with blessings in your journey, never give up. Um, can you tell us what that means to you? Yes. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I um, couldn't even take five steps without having to take a rest. So I say one step because if you were able to take one step, then the next day you'll be able to take two. And when you are given the ability to have one breath, you're given the ability to the next day to see two. Um, and that's why I say that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It's just one, one step, one breath to a journey of many blessings. Because mm-hmm. to live one more day is always a blessing. And to learn more about the disease is another blessing. And to be able to turn it around is totally another blessing. So changing my diet, 
having a doctor that was educated and being able to just exercise and get back to life was a beautiful thing. Wonderful. And if there is anything that um, you know now that you wish you could have told your former, your first diagnosed self, um, would it be that or is there anything, anything else? I, I would, it would be that, that, you know, clean eating, healthy living is the positive source to get you over that hump. So no smoking, no drinking, that sugar is bad, um, certain foods, and then just clean eating, eat more healthier, and then just don't give up and take that one step. Don't give up. Don't sit. Don't think about the disease and, and be sad and miserable. I mean, of course, the first um, month or as half a year, it was just a terrible situation. But once I got over that, it became clearer that what I needed to do, and I felt so much better, and it led to where I am now, the ability to run and run farther, to just do half marathons, full marathons, not saying that anyone needs to do that because that might not be your journey, but we all have a story. Well, that's terrific. Thank you so much for being with us today and to being a part of this and sharing your, your journey and your experience with us. We really appreciate it. And we hope you'll stick around because there's a, there are a few questions coming in. And just to remind folks that if you have um, any questions for, for Tia or Dr. Meyer, you can enter them in the Q&A box. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we had started to talk about, um, Dr. Meyer and Tia, is um, about finding resources and, and where um, patients and caregivers can turn to for support. Um, so we've identified a few here, and I know there uh, may be others. Um, so you are welcome to, to bring those to our awareness uh, in the Q&A box. Um, the American Lung Association um, offers information on our public-facing website at lung.org. Um, you can easily access our page on lung.org slash sarcoidosis. We also have our uh, helpline, which is staffed by nurses and respiratory therapists that can help, help answer any questions and help find support and resources in the community. Um, so recommend um, talking to our counselors um, at 1-800-LUNG-USA. Um, we also, the American Lung Association also offers our Better Breather Clubs, which is one of our oldest uh, programs available nationwide uh, to help patients uh, and with support um, and caregivers uh, who are living with a chronic lung disease. Um, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research also offers support groups specific to patients with sarcoidosis. Um, and they have more information available on their website at stopsarcoidosis.org. Um, in addition to that, you, they have information where you can help find a physician um, to treat sarcoidosis, um, and they offer an online support community on Inspire um, called uh, uh, FSR Sarcoidosis Online Support Community. The Lung Association also has one um, for um, patients living with a lung disease. Um, and then lastly, the American College for Chest Physicians and the Chest Foundation, um, they also have patient education resources on their website as well. And Dr. Meyer, I should ask because I know National Jewish has a number of um, resources for patients as well um, and just wanted to offer the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, what, they, what uh, folks can find at National Jewish. So we have um, a a lot of information on uh, sarcoidosis, frequently kind of frequently asked questions and, and an overview. Um, and in addition, uh, we also have, like the American Lung Association does, we sometimes, our nurses, we have nurses staffing phones and are also happy to answer some general questions um, if, if we're able to. Um, but there's a lot of information about some of the tests that you might need to be um, undergoing, you know, how to do lung function tests, what does that mean, how to, what does the chest x-ray CT, those are some of the, uh, in addition to the excellent um, resources on both the American Lung Association, FSR, and chest websites. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, we have a number of questions that have come in, and I know that we're not going to be able to get to them all. Um, and let me see if I can group a few together, because there were a few questions. And you talked a little bit about genetics in your presentation, but there seem to be some questions about, you know, what are the chances that my kids will get it? Um, you know, I have it, my sister has it. Um, and, you know, so can you talk a little bit more about um, genetics and how that plays into sarcoidosis? So, first of all, we don't right now, at this time, have a panel of, or certainly we have not one genetic test. Sarcoidosis is thought to be what's called a multigenetic test, which me, I mean, or disease, which means that there are likely many, many different genes that are coming together along with that exposure we talked about to result in disease. So there are some families um, that we know that have an increased risk, but we don't recommend testing people with genetics. Um, if you've got a family history, it's something that you need to let your kiddos or your siblings know about, and then if they have any kind of respiratory symptoms or other symptoms that could be sarcoidosis, that's where they need to see their doctor and maybe have a chest x-ray done um, if, if they're having respiratory symptoms. But to, the, your family members need to know about your history. But right now, we don't have good predictive tests to say that, first of all, just because you and your sister have it, that automatically your brother or your other sister is going to get it or your kids. And unfortunately, that's where we'd like to see the field moving, but we're not there yet. People just need to be aware of other members who do have it. Great. And then there are a number of questions about treatment. And some of them are um, regarding alternative treatments. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk to a little bit about um, alternative therapies and even exercise. Um, came up in, in the question box. So first of all, I'd like to thank um, Ms. Gray for her comments because I, I do think, um, and there's data to suggest that uh, exercise can improve lung disease in general. doesn't matter what the lung disease is, heart disease also, right? It is the single most predictor of all-cause mortality. So regardless of whether you have sarcoidosis or not, getting out there and getting active is going to help you. There have been some studies on this small fiber neuropathy, one of these parasarcoidoses, as well as fatigue and sarcoidosis to suggest that exercise can help improve those symptoms. And so, in general, our recommendation as sarcoidologists is to, to have people get out and exercise. Um, and, and sometimes it's hard because you're not feeling well. Yeah, and you're feeling fatigued, you go out and you take those two steps, as Tia mentioned, and you feel like you can't take the third. Um, but there, there are ongoing studies to suggest exercise and diet are anti-inflammatory. So while we can't say 100% in an individual that those are things that will make a difference, there is growing data in lung diseases, um, and I think we'll see more in sarcoidosis that those kinds of um, alternative approaches are helpful. There aren't really well-known alternative other therapies as far as, for example, acupuncture, or massage, or, or, or you know, chiropractic. There, there's not good data to suggest one way or another whether those will help. Um, again, healthy diet probably is a super important piece. The other one is it seems like people with sarcoidosis may, and I'm saying may because it hasn't been as well studied, have problems with sleep, whether it's the treatments, because steroids certainly can do that, or whether it's the disease itself, we don't know. But that's where we think it's also super important for people to get regular sleep. So those are kind of good health maintenance issues that, um, again, I want to just call out and thank Tia for bringing to our attention. Definitely. I'm so inspired about her marathon running. <laughs> so um, we do have a question here specific to treatment. Um, if you have been treated with methyltextrate once and discontinued for six years, can the drug be used again effectively? So 
Methotrexate is, um, we use methotrexate as a steroid sparing agent to try to either reduce or avoid steroid use. And some people will be treated with both and some people will be treated with one. And oftentimes um, we will treat people for between 18 months to three years with methotrexate and then stop it. Sometimes we do see recurrences. It's not uncommon. Most of us who take care of sarcoidosis patients think it's worth giving people a, a drug holiday, if you will. People have the right to know if their disease is going to progress or not. However, once it does progress, oftentimes the same agents will be effective. Not always, but it's usually a good place to start if the disease does come back. Great. And then I think we only have time for one more question. Um, and uh, there's a question that came in about what can be done to reduce fibrosis. So this is the, the, the really bad outcome from a lung standpoint. Um, and the, the honest answer right now is we don't know. It's an active area of investigation. The um, fibrosis, uh, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research is looking at some of this as well as other institutions and groups across the country. In general, our hope is by starting treatment early, we may be able to avoid some of those effects. But it may be that different agents are needed. And so those are some trials that are actually ongoing and um, looking at agents that have been used for other fibrotic diseases in sarcoidosis to see if those can help. Um, but unfortunately, we don't understand why some people develop fibrosis and why others don't. And I think until we understand that, it may be hard to figure out how to prevent it. Um, but certainly, staying on top of your disease is probably an important piece with your doctor. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so for those of you, if we did not get to your question, um, we, we have all these questions saved, and we will do our best to actually respond to you directly. Um, so we will make a point of trying to do that after uh, today's call. We would appreciate your feedback, and we have a quick survey that will launch at the end of this webinar. So if you could just take, um, it should only take about five minutes to complete, five to ten minutes to complete, we would really appreciate hearing from you. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers today, Dr. Meyer, Ms. Gray, um, the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research for your help um, in putting today's webinar together, and lastly, um, to Malincrot, um, who made this webinar possible. Um, we really appreciate all of your support. So again, uh, thank you, and this, this concludes today's call.